please make uh, your, uh, your cell phone uh, silent as we have interpretation and you can use headphone in your seats if you have any questions please give it to give it in writing to the person in charge of the auditorium after the end of the lecture putting into account that no questions will be accepted after the lecture your excellencies uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. In the name of Dr. Uh, Jamal Aswaidi, Director of the ECSSR, I welcome you to the center where we will listen to a lecture entitled UA Public uh, Policy, New Frontiers in government innovations, educations, and uh, internal, uh, and, uh, and it will be delivered by uh, uh, Susan uh, Pointer. She is in charge of the uh, uh, public uh, uh, policies and government uh, senior relations of Google. She manages senior teams for uh, countries. Uh, Pointers led uh, in the past the public policies of Google's in Europe, Middle East, and Africa from London. Now, she is she works for uh, from Hong Kong. She joined Google for more than seven years. Before that, she spent six years as an international manager of public policies of Amazon from both Brussels and London. She chaired the European team of uh, UK Industries Federation in Brussels. She worked at the a parliament ad advisor in the European Parliament and chief advisor in the British uh, Parliament. Mrs. Boynter, welcome to the uh, uh, for your lecture. Hello, let me check for the microphones. Yes, wonderful. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for, for the very kind introduction and the invitation to be here today. It's my first time in Abu Dhabi, in fact, and I'm very honored uh, and humbled to have this opportunity to speak before all of you today. I'm particularly humbled having just seen the very long list of very distinguished speakers that have come before me speaking to this room. Before I start, I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Jawal al Swedi, Director General of the Emirates Center for Strategic Studies and Research, for facilitating this event tonight. I also want to thank Hoda and Maha in the Centre's conference department for all their hard work in making tonight happen and for all their wonderful partnership with my team. These things don't just happen by default. A lot of hard work goes into it and a lot of coordination. So thank you for that. As you heard, my name is Susan Pointer and I look after government relations and public policy for Google across Asia Pacific, Middle East, Africa, Russia, former Soviet republics, Thankfully, though, I don't cover such a large region entirely on my own, but have a great team of colleagues on the ground around that region, including Sam here in the Arab Gulf states, and Khalid also here this evening, who is based in North Africa. Our role as a public policy team is very much to act as a point of contact and communication for Google in the region. Particularly as, particularly as far as policy discussions and partnerships with government are concerned. And very much to engage in the sort of thoughtful conversation about technology and the internet that we are having here this evening. By way of background, as you heard, I have been lucky enough to work in government, both at national level and pan-regional level, with industry associations, and most recently in two of the most innovative and interesting companies on the planet, Amazon.com and now Google, where I've been, as you heard, for some seven years. In this role, I've covered some 120 plus countries along the way, and have a, it's been a, an incredible privilege to be on this constant learning uh, journey uh, in all of those countries. And there isn't a single one of those countries 
that isn't having very similar discussions about technology and its potential impact as the one we are having here today. Working across such a wide range of countries and issues at Google, there are, of course, so many topics I could cover and many fascinating experiences I could share with you. But I thought I would focus this evening on the following. The positive opportunities that internet technologies offer us all for the economy, for culture, for society more broadly, with a particular focus on education, and I'll come back to that, and how we really cannot merely take these opportunities for granted, but we need to grasp and nurture them for the benefit of all of our communities now and into the future. I'll also want to say a little bit about the unique characteristics of the technology itself that enable this explosion of innovation and shared creativity to happen in such an unprecedented way. I'll say a little bit about, how, about what we see to be important prerequisites for an environment that is set up for success in harnessing these innovation opportunities. Whether that be in the workplace, in government, in our education and social institutions, and indeed for us at Google. I'll also share some thoughts on the particular strengths that I believe the Gulf countries have in this digital and entrepreneurial age, and how these can in turn help enrich the wider world. And then finally, some thoughts on what I think all of this means for all of us here, and for policy making more generally in the 21st century and beyond. The starting point is clear. We are living in the most wonderfully interesting and exciting times an industrial digital quantum leap on a global scale, playing out minute by minute, even as we sit here and stand here in the room here today, a historic leap that brings about unprecedented opportunities for access to information and learning, for connecting people and ideas, and for bringing new tools to help us tackle big global issues. In fact, this opportunity to change the world for the better is very much what inspired me personally to work for technology companies. I don't come from a privileged background. I didn't have access to elite schools and world-class teachers. My access to books was limited to what the small local library close to where I grew up held. My family had very limited possibilities to travel outside of my home country when I was growing up. So glimpses of life elsewhere from books or from visitors were very, very precious and impactful. Although I didn't realize this at the time, I was very happy, my ability to compete on a level playing field with many others in society, my own and others, and contribute to my maximum extent was relatively limited and challenged. My view of even what might be possible was relatively narrow. Three things, there were three things that changed my outlook on the world and in turn drove my current career. My father, who didn't have many opportunities in life himself, but he understood the value of education to open new doors on the world, to expand options, and also for self-value and self-motivation. From a young age, he took me to those local libraries, explored language with me through magazines and papers, and instilled in me a great sense of learning being one of life's great privileges. The resources available to him at that time were pretty limited and very local. But nonetheless, these were powerful enough to see me on my path to college and then university. Then, Many years later, when the internet came along, I immediately grasped that this new technology had the capacity to replicate in some way what my father had done for me personally, but at the most unbelievably enormous scale, and for people all around the world. Many of the world's books, writings, and cultures were now available at my fingertips. And of, the, and, and of those of many others too. Access to learning 
and knowledge was suddenly less determined by location and background, but by access to a global platform of digital possibilities. And there was better still to come, the third element in my transition. <laughs> the realization that the internet was not just a platform for accessing static information, but would also prove to be an enabling platform for people around the world to contribute to society and achieve great things themselves, whether that be entrepreneurs starting a business that reaches a global customer base, researchers collaborating across borders to realize great scientific or medical insights, or historians and artists bringing their cultural heritage, their culture and creativity to the broader world. This was, I realized that this was potentially the basis for a more globally inclusive communications platform than the world had ever seen before. I personally am very privileged to now travel very widely in my role, including visiting some of the world's poorest countries and to see how the internet and particularly mobile technologies are fueling new opportunities, inclusion and innovation in the most remote and least advantageous places in the world is truly awe-inspiring. What the light bulb was to the 19th century, the internet is no doubt to the 21st century. Its impact all pervasive, changing the way we communicate, consume, work, and learn, driving new business models and bringing efficiencies and innovation to old, impacting our daily lives at the micro level and countries' competitiveness and future at the macro level. Let me talk about some of those opportunities, the economic, cultural, societal opportunities. Let me start with the economic opportunities. Almost overnight, the internet emerged as a key part of economic life in many parts of the world, and increasingly now in all parts of the world, thanks to this expanding mobile access. The internet has provided us with, with an inherent global marketplace, empowering consumers and driving greater choice, greater competition, and greater efficiencies, and not just at the multinational company level. In fact, research shows that it's the small and niche enterprises that often have the most to gain from this new platform. No longer is a business restricted by who it can reach locally or who its agents, perhaps, can reach elsewhere in another country. An online business is inherently a global business or will quickly have opportunities to become one. Once upon a time, expanding internationally was feasible only for big companies with deep pockets. Now any business or even any individual entrepreneur can go global from day one, with success or failure in the hands of empowered consumers and individuals who themselves benefit from unprecedented choice. What we have here is a virtuous circle a study published last year by the Boston Consulting Group found that the UAE is a regional leader in terms of ease of access and use of the internet. Those of you in this room will know that. The study was based on looking at an index of factors that can inhibit businesses, consumers, and others from fully participating in the internet economy. And they did this by comparing countries across 65 leading economies. The UAE, as you will know, was noted as one of the leading MENA countries. It's not surprising, therefore, that many internet multinationals, including Google, have chosen their regional headquarters and business hubs in the UAE. But as the saying goes, the future is still ahead of us. And in this respect, so much more exciting potential in the economic field lies with today's entrepreneurs and today's budding entrepreneurs and enthusiasts and what they will do by, by way of innovation in the years to come. Given the tech enthusiasm in the region, I have no doubt that this will drive local innovation and open up new, exciting economic opportunities and ideas. And at Google, 
we are partnering directly with many of those entrepreneurs and budding entrepreneurs through partnerships with startup accelerator programs like Flat Six Labs and Wanda Mix and Mentor, to name two in the region. In the UAE last year, we announced that we are teaming up with Astro Labs, a regional technology startup hub based here in the UAE to help scale online startups and support the next generation of regional tech entrepreneurs. The hub includes training spaces where in-house experts on user experience, design and digital marketing can advise entrepreneurs. And we know that the world is going, global, uh, going mobile, and we know that this region has a real advantage in that space. Around the world, mobile internet usage is quickly exceeding desktop usage. With the UAE's great strength in this area and smartphone penetration, there is enormous potential for new mobile entrepreneurs to come from this region right here and leapfrog old technologies. I know that you just hosted here the world's largest Android developer conference a few weeks ago, and we know that the app economy is a new, fast-growing, emerging sector of the economy. And again, there are advantages to get ahead on this here. So much innovation is happening before our eyes in this region. Saudi Arabia developed from a country with low single-digit internet penetration to a country with the world's highest per capita usage of YouTube and Twitter. The average Saudi user watches three times as many YouTube videos a day than are watched in the US. <laughs> Google was founded by two smart students from a, gar from, a, from a dormitory in San Francisco. Who knows, maybe as we speak, there are Emirati entrepreneurs working from a garage in Abu Dhabi right now, inventing a new groundbreaking concept or business. As we always say at Google, our competition is only one click away. The next user click may well go to an app or a site invented right here. And then I want to say a little bit about the cultural opportunities. A really exciting and often overlooked area of digitally empowered success is that in the field of culture. This is based on exactly that same platform, that increased access to content and an unrivaled capacity to share and exchange content through a shared and global online platform. This is enabling us both to better preserve the world's existing cultural heritage, but also simultaneously to help make it more widely accessible and understood to more people. This story is true for historic artifacts, for art, music, textiles, photography, language, writings, sounds, and pictures. Whether these were traditionally hosted and curated only in the world's biggest galleries and museums, or at the other end of the scale, whether these were items treasured in family archives. There is often a misperception that technology and culture don't mix. This is simply not the case. Every single day around the world, I personally see wonderful examples of the symbiotic relationship between new technology and cultural heritage. Communications technologies can help showcase a country's culture and provide new ways of engaging an audience and, artist, and new ways of artistic creation and support and exploration. Technology can drive new curiosity and learning about a culture, deeper insights or understanding, and even prompt tourism, be that virtual or physical, to new locations and new parts of the world. We know that internet tools can help promote an entire country's culture and profile globally, I don't know if any of you in this room have heard of Sai's Gangnam Style video, a Korean video released on YouTube that went global and is now driving a country's tourism and cultural sector. This new world is enabled not only by the billions of web pages and audiovisual materials, but also by computer translation between multiple languages, 
Traditionally, 99% of what people wrote, published, or generated never left the language in which it was first created. This digital lowering of linguistic barriers is a gateway to a better mutual understanding. Although, at the same time, I do accept that we have a long way to go to ensure that the world's languages are better represented on the internet, and we're working very hard at that. It was this belief in the beneficial coexistence of culture and technology that drove Google to set up an online cultural institute. The idea was to enable cultural institutions around the world to bring their collections to a global audience via the power of a digital platform. A few months ago, we were very proud to cooperate with the UAE National Archives on our first Cultural Institute collection here, here for the Arab world. The online exhibit we launched together highlights historic moments leading up to the formation of the Emirates in 1971. The items on display on that digital platform range from photographs of the first raising of the flag after the, after the establishment to early editions of the first national set of stamps. Just go to google.com forward slash cultural institute and you'll find your way to that online archive. This UAE exhibit has attracted a lot of interest. The launch video we created, which I'd like to share with you now, has already received over 1.3 million views on YouTube. isn't about replacing physical culture. It's about helping us appreciate it, celebrate it, extend it, and bring it to the attention of more people. The Ramadan hub that Google has powered for the last few years is another wonderful example. To help bring the significance and value of this holy month to more people, we put together a Ramadan hub with information on ways in which online tools and services can help people get the most out of this precious time and enjoy the holiday with family and friends. Tools such as local time countdown to sunset, Ramadan-related apps on Google Play that offer special recipes for iftar and sohur, relevant YouTube videos, and more. The world is full of wondrous places, some famed for their natural beauty, others for their cultural, historic, or merely personal importance. With Google Street View, we are making it possible for anyone with online access to take a virtual visit to those places. One of these marvels is the iconic Sheikh Syed Grand Mosque Center in Abu Dhabi, now accessible to the world via Google Street View. This collection sits alongside other iconic Street View collections for the UAE. The world's tallest skyscraper, Burj Khalifa, and the world's largest passenger plane, the Emirates Airbus A380. We recently decided to take UAE natural beauty to another level on Street View. 
and capture imagery of Abu Dhabi's Liwa Desert, including a, uh, using a camel uh, to, to carry the camera. I think this was a first in, in Google's uh, history. <laughs> yes, that's right, a camel. And the camel's name was Rafia, and we're very grateful to Rafia. Now, people around the world can, can virtually sit on that very same camel and explore the desert dunes through a collection of 360 degree imagery. A video we produced featuring this launch has already attracted over 9 million views and that's growing every day. Street imagery is also available in Dubai, and we are looking to expand our coverage here in Abu Dhabi and across the wider Middle East. Uh, watch this space. We hope, of course, that people's virtual travel will also inspire them, if they're able to, to visit these amazing places in person. And technology is not just about preserving the old or existing. It's very much also about creating the new. Today's artists, designers, writers, and producers are not just sharing creations digitally, they are making them digitally too, often co-creating through online cross-border collaboration. Platforms like YouTube have become global stages. With over 300 hours of video uploaded to YouTube every minute, and billions of views every day, there are new opportunities for local artists to tap into the long tail of niche audiences around the world. And I don't have time today in this short lecture to go into all of those. Uh, there are many, many uh, exciting opportunities, just as with economic and just as with cultural, that technology is offering by way of connection and serving communities and society better. One example, perhaps, the UAE National Ambulance System, which, in, which embeds Google Maps in all call center technology to help shave valuable seconds off emergency dispatch times and journeys. But I do, when we're looking at the societal field, want to spend a little bit more time back where I started this lecture, on education, since I know that it is very dear to the hearts of many of us in this room and also to the region's ambitious policy priorities and plans. At a time when so many aspects of our lives are being transformed by digital technologies, it's not surprising that we are all looking for opportunities to harness this in our education systems too. The potential for positive change is enormous. You only need to look at what organizations like the Khan Academy are, do are already doing offering thousands of lessons online, via videos, addressing topics from algebra to art history. I know that this, in turn, has inspired a YouTube channel launched two years ago by the UAE Ministry of Education, Etislat and Google, with 600 educational videos and 120,000 views helping young people with their studies. It follows the curriculum of the UAE. This program is structured as classes online. Its purpose was to create a YouTube community for pre-university students and teachers that surfaces relevant and easily searchable video clips that teachers can use in the classroom to enhance student learning. This UAE program 
covers everything from science to maths to languages. The most watched content is apparently biology, chemistry, and English videos. The most popular lesson is a grade 12 biology lecture on the human genome. <laughs> in light of these education revolutions, and we are still very much in the early days, governments around the world are realizing that digital literacy is key. Around the world, ICT skills are increasingly equated with life skills. Digital literacy is increasingly indivisible from literacy, just as the economy is increasingly a digital economy or a digitally empowered economy. I know that the UAE leadership has set out a very clear vision on this in its 2021 vision at the federal level, aiming to spark young people's curiosity about science, technology, engineering, and maths education. The government has big plans, I know, to equip young people with 21st century skills and give them options to develop, accelerate, and build this country's knowledge economy. This is a wonderful base for securing all of those economic, cultural, and societal benefits I mentioned earlier. In support of that vision, we announced in February of this year our support for the Innovation Hub Community Center in Ras al Khaim. Uh, Haima, in collaboration with Al Bayt Mid Wahid and the UAE Teachers Association. This hub, this digital innovation hub, is now serving the community of over 47,000 students and 2,500 teachers and is open to students across the Northern Emirates and, in fact, the whole UAE. The hub is providing robotics and intro introductory computer science classes to young people, and providing teachers with training on how technology can be integrated into teaching. When Al Bayt McMidwide Google UA Teachers Association and EduTech launched this innovation hub, we also announced with our partners a robotics competition to help generate excitement in science, technology, engineering, and math subjects. In fact, I met with the winners of this competition earlier today, an inspiring group of young Emiratis, intermediate level two students and high school students from Ajman with no robotics or computer science background. Their schools and their families drove them every day for four weeks to these classes to prepare for, robot for this robotics competition, to learn basic robotic design skills, teamwork, and basic programming skills. These ins inspiring Emirati young people joined the Innovation Hub not just to win a competition, but to get training and preparation to start their own robotics club at their schools. And here's a video that gives a, a, an example of the work that's happening there. We just recently launched the innovation strategy and of course there is no better time to announce this innovation hub than now. Innovation Hub is an initiative of Al Bayt Al Mitwahid with the cooperation of Google and the Teachers Association. We at Edutech are pleased to be associated with this initiative in creating this learning environment which is a combination of a learning space and a mini maker space. The most important principle in this is that you really need to think big. You really need to think that you can change the world. The Innovation Hub is situated in Ras Al Khaimah. It will be open to the public. It's a new type of offering for the community. We also think that it will attract the students from neighboring Emirates. And of course, they will be exposed for the first time to these technologies that are available in this lab. Here is where students can come to learn, to make, to create, to design, to play, and to do. علمنا وايد أشياء مثل كيف أنا أكون قيادية، الخلايا الشمسية، الروبوتكس وأشياء وايد مثل الإلكترونيات، برامج في الكمبيوتر، 
فانا تعلمت من هالاشياء اني استفيد منهم في الدروس اللي في المدرسه فشيء حلو We had a lot of visits from school principals uh, educators teachers they want to you know take this experience to their schools this place had definitely impacted this community طبعا المختبر هو مكان جاذب للطالب هذا النادي مزود باحدث وسائل التكنولوجيا اللي هي موجودة في مجال STEM. We think that students should have opportunities to become the next generation of active creators of technology beyond being consumers of it. We hope to socialize the idea that it's not enough to come up with solutions, but we have to actively work together with all the stakeholders in the community, including nonprofits, the private sector, government, and educators. in order to affect long-lasting positive change. The country has not spared any efforts in terms of developing the youth, and we believe that offering the innovation hub to the community where they get exposed to these technologies and these fields in such interactive and engaging ways will definitely stimulate the future generations to develop these skills further. <laughs> مثل ما فيهم جرأة لكن الحين كأن فيهم قيادة فها شيء يحمسني وايد أن ها شيء حلو بالنسبة لي Thank you. In fact, the concepts that we've tested here have proven to be so powerful that we are already applying lessons learned to it to a new facility launched by Google in Rome in Italy. That particular site is helping provide digital skills training and creative spaces for unemployed Italian young people. The best projects are usually done through partnerships, and I know that Abu Dhabi has done a lot to drive new education partnerships. Partnerships with MIT at Mazdar Institute focus on renewable energies, establishing Khalifa University of Science and Technology, and bringing New York universities to set up a full-fledged branch campus here. These all help enrich and drive the knowledge economy locally and build the knowledge and ambassadors of Abu Dhabi and the UAE elsewhere. So what is it about internet technologies in particular that enable this expansion of innovation and shared creativity to happen in such an unprecedented way? It's the wide communication and distribution channels. Channel scarcity is no longer the topic of discussion. There are low barriers to entry that mean there are opportunities to participate for anyone who, is, who has access. The technology is inherently cross-border and global, providing us with an, with an, in, with an inherent global marketplace. And I would say the closest we've got to date on that journey towards economic perfect information that empowers consumers and enables more informed choices, and which in turn drives greater competition across value and service. The technology is such that the local can also be global. This concept of micro-nationals, micro-multinationals, This platform openness and interactivity supports maximum information exchange and collaboration. The immediacy of the feedback loop is especially, especially in an always-on mobile environment, has provided a pl platform for soliciting material, for crowdsourcing insights, and for testing ideas with others. This inherent cross-border, open, decentralized communications platform is what makes it different from and more powerful than anything that we've had before. We need to consciously acknowledge and protect these unique characteristics in order to continue to preserve them and to derive the benefits for the world that I mentioned earlier. A few words on what we see as the as the important prerequisites for an environment that is set up for success in harnessing innovation and technology-based opportunities for people, whether in the workplace, in government, in schools, and indeed, as I said earlier, at Google. We're all working very hard at this. 
in addition to the technological enablers for innovation. It is also important to have the cultural facilitators of innovation, and that includes our own mindsets, whatever our day jobs, whatever our organizations. Companies, governments, and universities alike are dismantling the historic stereotype that innovation, entrepreneurial environments are just for R&D and IT departments. Innovation and new ideas do not always emerge from the obvious places. At Google, we call this innovation at the edges. So organizations need to be set up to allow for innovation at the edges. And that means broad and cross-departmental communications and information. We refer to it as default open within our organization. A healthy disrespect for the impossible opportunities for different parts of the organization that may on paper have very different roles, but opportunities for them to mix and cross-fertilize ideas. This is the power of creative clusters. It's also essential to have a willingness to experiment and the other side of that coin, an acceptance that that will sometimes mean failure. An, an expectation of constant iteration is important and constant investment in the skills and abilities of people, that very important human capital. The UAE has so many strengths that enable the Gulf countries to relish and thrive in the digital age. An advanced ICT infrastructure and high internet and mobile penetration investment capital, a multicultural and multilingual environment, a joy in innovation combined with an entrepreneurial spirit, a rich cultural heritage and a modern arts and innovation base to share with the world. It also has a leading position on mobile adoption and engagement, and that will set it up for new opportunities, new inventions, Many, many of which will inspire tomorrow's innovations and businesses. And it has a government with an ambitious vision to succeed in the digital society and the knowledge economy age. Around the world, governments are putting technology at the center of their thinking, and I know that the UAE is no exception. It's safe to say, as you might have guessed, that I'm certainly a glass half full person when it comes to the internet and mobile web opportunities. And I strongly believe that our generations have been presented with a historically unprecedented opportunity and tools and capacity to make a positive difference in the world. We are holding in our hands that unique opportunity, one that we should certainly not take for granted but we certainly should cherish, nurture, and grasp. In this 2015 year of innovation, let's celebrate that possibility and harness that potential. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mrs. Pointer, for this uh, lecture, which has focused on the UAE public policy. Kindly, we shall start the Q&A so that Mrs. Pointer will answer these questions. The questions are written down on uh, on a piece of paper. Kindly write your question down on a piece of paper. Okay, so I've already got a great question here. So the question is, how can Google assist the UAE government in its public policy plans in education for 2020 and 2030? So I think we've, we've been spending, in fact, I've been spending quite a lot of time over the past couple of days already having exactly that conversation. And I think there are two main areas we've been focusing on so far, but we're very aware that there are so many more things that we can do also, and we're at the 
you know, we're very much at um, a staging post in that conversation. So we're very excited that there will be even more opportunities to come. But I think the two areas that we're focusing on are really how can we bring about our interest and expertise and experience in terms of inspiring young people to take advantage of STEM education to really give them a great basis to then explore whatever is their passion. And it may be that that robotics competition actually just does no more than removes a fear of technology or a fear of science or a fear of mathematics. And that in turn may, you know, may even send them into becoming fantastic lawyers focusing on the technology community or fantastic doctors that, that, that realize that technology will be part of that world. So I think in one sense, a lot of the investment is really helping to show what is possible to remove fear uh, and to inspire young people uh, to experiment, in fact. And a lot of the uh, robotics competition that we've been talking about in the last couple of days is as much about demonstrating that teamwork and experimenting and failure is part of the process as it is about robotics. Um, and giving people the, that, that confidence to realize that they can experiment uh, and that they should experiment because if we are going to solve the world's big problems, you know, these will require new solutions that we don't currently have. So experimentation, collaboration, teamwork will be part of that. And then the second area that we're really focusing on is digital literacy. Uh, and I mentioned that in my comments earlier. You know, we're, we're very conscious that the, the internet technologies, new technologies bring about so many opportunities, but we also need to equip people, especially young people, but not exclusively young people. There are many people who would benefit from greater confidence in this area to really feel comfortable using online tools to have um, the availability of things like workshops that will show them how to stay safe online, how to be thoughtful about how they operate online, how to be respectful for others, and how to flag issues of concern. So another area, we, so the second area we're investing in, uh, and we've been discussing that and look forward to more programs in this space, we want to launch these very soon, in fact, um, is, is to enhance that digital literacy capacity because it's not just a, a, a knowledge of technology that's in, important. It's also a knowledge of how we use technology responsibly uh, and equip young people uh, with those skills. And that is not something that will come just from Google. That's something that we absolutely understand we need to partner with the education establishment, teachers, learners, trainers, uh, government authorities, the Ministry of Education, and others to really take that work forward. It's something we already do, in fact, in many parts of the world, and we're uh, looking right now to um, accelerate the introduction of that here in this region, and we've been having that conversation just this week. So I hope to kick that off very soon. Oops, another one. <laughs> oh, lots. Um, well, I think I'll answer this one because it's top of the pile, but it's also quite quick given, given what I've just said. So the question is, what is your favorite Google project in MENA that you've seen and why? And I, you know, there's inevitably, inevitably going to be a little bit of rep repetition here because some of the projects I presented earlier are ones that really truly excite me and which I think showcase the variety of ways in which digital technologies and communications can inspire people in this region, but also can uh, showcase the region. So I think because this morning I spent time with those students who had been uh, involved in the uh, innovation, uh, in the innovation hub, uh, in their robotics competitions, and I'm still smiling because there was such power and enthusiasm in that room. And you could tell that just that small project, that starting project, had opened the eyes of so many young people to what might be possible. Um, so even now as I speak about it, I'm, I'm smiling and I had the opportunity to speak directly with so many of those students. And, and those, I think those um, events are incredibly powerful. Uh, and as I said earlier, um, I'm very passionate about um, 
opening up the possibilities of cult greater cultural awareness. I think that's really important for the world that we want to live in. Um, so that's, that's very important to me. And as I mentioned right at the beginning of my presentation, the thing very genuinely that still inspires me today is, is just that opportunity to bring education and inclusion to um, you know, a much, much bigger uh, range of people uh, across the world. And I, I still very, very strongly believe that that's the internet's greatest opportunity and it's why I'm so passionate about those possibilities. I've got lots of questions, so I should keep going. The other, the other thing, and, and I'm sure you will have heard this about Google, the other thing is thinking big. You know, we still have our core business, we work very hard at that, but at the same time, we're also dreaming big and thinking big. Um, and interestingly, when you think really big, you have less competition because there are fewer people dreaming about the impossible. So it's a really great place to be, really thinking about what is possible. And um, every dream starts off being a crazy dream, but many of those dreams become realities. And I think it's, it's continuously uh, looking for those moonshots, what Google calls moonshots. So at the same time, we're really maximizing our core business and, and really working very hard for our consumers and our users. Also thinking about what more is possible. Um, and that's very part, much part of our culture as well. So just to sum, sum up, you know, no, no room for complacency. Um, we work very hard every single day to stay innovative and to, to keep uh, developing, keep innovating, keep dreaming. Great question. Um, so the question is, so are public-private partnerships the way forward in terms of technological innovation? I think um, a broad answer to that question is that partnership, you always achieve more through partnerships. There are some things that governments need very much to be involved in, things like access. Uh, telco companies obviously need to be very involved in creating opportunities for access. Um, but then it's really, in terms of creativity, it really is collaboration. It really is, you know, what, what can we do that is new? How can we work together to make things happen? So I think, certainly in personal, speaking personally, I think sometimes you can get over-focused on how to call a particular project. Is it a public-private partnership? Is it something else? I think it's much better to be focused on what are we trying to achieve? Uh, and then who do we need to work with to get it done? Um, so I think, you know, it's, it's, it's about being less formulaic in terms of what the process looks like and really thinking big about how do we address this problem and then who is excited to work with us and work with others to get that done? And I think that's a much more healthy and um, positive environment to take things forward. That will inevitably involve involve public-private partnerships and all sorts of other partnerships. But I think it's about, you know, focus on what, what you're trying to achieve and, and what you're trying to improve and what are, the, what are the problems you're trying to address. And then bringing in the most energized, excited, innovative uh, people that you can to really work to make that happen. With the vast amount of information and content that Google has, will Google ever plan to have an online or virtual school available free of cost? <laughs> I don't have any formal announcements this evening. <laughs> um, I think I would refer back to what I said earlier about you know, the, what, what we like to do is provide platforms at scale. Um, and it's that scale that then enables so many more people to build on that platform to reach audiences. And some of the examples I gave earlier about um, you know, YouTube videos, the, the YouTube videos are not videos that Google has necessarily produced or filmed, but what we've done is provided the platform for so many others with their areas of expertise to present their way of doing things uh, to the broader community. Um, and those channels, and, and YouTube is just one example, um, are very, very powerful. I, mean, I know personally that when I'm looking to solve a problem, when I'm looking to fix something at home, 
when I unintentionally lock my suitcase by accident, <laughs> when I unintentionally, you know, can't do some DIY at home, the fact that you can go online and search and find an answer to that, and that has been provided by, you know, some expert in, in a country that you haven't thought about, a person you don't know, who, who very uh, generously is offering and sharing their, their expertise and, and their experience to help a broader community. I personally, and, and I'm not speaking um, specifically for, for Google at this point, but I, th I do think, as I mentioned in my presentation, that we really are at the early stages still of some really exciting opportunities to empower uh, young people and, and people of all ages uh, in terms of ongoing learning. Uh, and I mentioned when we were speak, you know, speaking earlier that I think more than the world has ever seen before, there is a real onus on all of us to continue learning. Um, in fact, one of the students this morning asked me a very interesting question, which was, do you have to be a computer scientist to make a difference? And I said, no, that's one way in. That's one way to experiment, to reduce barriers, to re reduce fears, to follow your passions, to follow your dreams. But actually, the most important thing of all is to enjoy learning uh, and to really maximize the opportunities that, that we have nowadays and to really take those opportunities to keep learning. It's very clear to me, for example, you know, Larry and Sergey that built Google, they, I, I know that they are every day learning and they're using the internet for those learning opportunities. They're curious about the world, they're curious about different areas of expertise, whether that's in science or technology or health or medicine or or manufacturing or robotics. And it's that constant curiosity that is key. And I, again, as I said earlier, the, the biggest danger is complacency and the biggest danger is that you think you already know everything. And I think we have unprecedented access to information. But actually it's very humbling. You know, the more information out there, the more we realize how little we all know. Uh, and I think our journey collectively is to really benefit and really be humble about how much more we have to learn and to continue that learning journey constantly. And I think that's part of the process. Again, it's, it's really about, about having access to ongoing learning. And I thought that was a great question from uh, the students this morning. There were so many. <laughs> I've done that one. What's this one? So this, as, as a concerned father, I wonder what is Google doing to ensure kids' safety on the internet and to make sure the content of Google or YouTube is clean? Um, another great question, and as I mentioned earlier, it's something we um, are very focused on. Uh, and in the meetings I've had, literally in the last two days. Um, we've really been trying to accelerate in conjunction with the Ministry of Education and others uh, to accelerate a lot of the programs that we can do, we do do in different parts of the world. Um, the digital literary, uh, literacy programs that I mentioned earlier. Um, I think, as I said, I think we all have a, a role in that partnership and certainly you know, companies like Google and others um, have a role to play in that. We're very proactive about that. It's something we do in many countries, as I say, and it's something we want to do here. But we want to do it in conjunction with, with the government, with experts, with teachers, um, because it, it's very important and it needs the confidence in all of those stakeholders. So it's something that everyone is excited to do, and we're just moving it forward so that we can launch that. We have lots of digital programs and literacy programs that we can bring. And then the, the additional point is, you know, the internet is a big space, certainly for, for Google um, and our products and services. Uh, and let me speak about YouTube, for example, is we have what, what are called community guidelines. Uh, and you can look those up, they're publicly accessible. Uh, and we have, we have mechanisms by which, you know, we say we don't want certain content on our services. 
and on our systems. So our community guidelines do address things like privacy, like incitement to hatred, um, and uh, these, uh, it's very public, you can, you can search these and look at these. And, and uh, based on our community guidelines, that, that's what we do to address that content and remove that content uh, and to ensure that it's a, a safe environment um, for us. So thank you very much indeed, thank you.